In the previous video, I gave an introduction to Latin class analysis without going into technical details. In this video, I want to discuss the underlying statistical model, which means assumptions, equations, and also a little bit about estimation. To be more, more concrete, I will discuss more assumptions and equations, and I will explain the principle of maximum likelihood estimation. For this purpose, I will use a very small data set consisting of three dichotomous indicators. The data is taken from the G uh, General Social Survey 1987. The data file is called anti dot. It consists of three variables with two categories. And the topic is let's say, attitudes towards persons that express themselves anti-religion. And so the first variable uh, is, let's say, answered by allowed, not allowed. And the question is, allow anti-religionists to speak. And the second variable is, allow anti-religionists to teach. And the third variable is, remove anti-religious books from the library. One means not remove, two is remove. And so people, let's say, one on everything, they are, let's say, let's say not negative against anti-religious uh, expressions and people that say the, give the second answer or let's say uh, against uh, uh, being or let's say speaking teaching or writing in an anti-religious way this is the, this is the possible uh, the smallest possible application of latent class analysis and i mean with this uh, three dichotomous variables that's the minimum if you have two dichotomous variables you cannot perform a latent class analysis and the, tip, and the typical applications will have like five or six or seven variables, uh, to, let's say, for, for the analysis. Here you see the data set in the form of a multidimensional frequency table. And actually, the, the, uh, the data set itself also looks like this. Namely, uh, three columns uh, with uh, the, the three y variables and then a frequency count indicating how many persons uh, we have in each pattern. As so you can see that the most likely responses are the one 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 response and the two to two response, which are let's say the consistent responses, and the other responses uh, are less likely, but they also are present in the data file. You can see that about 700 people have the one 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 bad pattern, and in terms of a proportion, that's about 40%. And 366 people persons have the to the two pattern, which in terms of a proportion is about 20%, slightly more than 20%. I'm going, I'm going to analyze this data set with Latin Gold and look at the profile output. And then on the next, next, next transparency, you see the profile output, uh, but I will do the analysis now step by step. I will start Latin Gold. And I will open the data file anti really dot dot, which is also part of the most patient version of Latin Gold to the demo data folder. Um, I will open it and I will specify a cluster model. For this purpose, I select the indicators in the indicators box. I specify them to be nominal, but also important, I also have the Frequency count uh, n in the data file, and this is not individual records, but this uh, the, the data file is in the form of a frequency table, and I have to use that as a case weight. And so now we are ready uh, to estimate models with different number of classes. We could estimate one cluster model, a two cluster model, and that's actually every, everything that you can do uh, if you have three dichotomous indicators. But we're not concerned about model selection now here, uh, so we are going to look into model equations. Uh, so and I'm not going to talk about the model selection issue and focus now on the two cluster model. I estimated the two cluster model and we can look at the profile output to see how the clusters look like. So to interpret the clusters, as you can see, 62% uh, of the sample belongs to cluster number one. 38% to cluster number two, uh, cluster number one 
is really likely to give the one response, uh, the, the response uh, indicating that you're not against anti-religious expressions, and then and cluster number uh, two is much more likely uh, to give the two response. Uh, so you could label cluster number one as the liberals and cluster number two as the conservatives. Uh, so then we are kind of done in terms of interpretation. But there are several questions of interest if you want to know, learn a bit more about Latin class analysis. So the question is, how does it statistical model look like that we're estimating? And so we get some results, we get this profile output, but what, what's the underlying model behind it? And how do we estimate this model? In other words, the software is a kind of black box and gives you a result that makes sense, I guess. Huh? So you put in this data, you find two clusters. One cluster which is more likely to give the one response, and one cluster which is more likely to give the two responses. Yeah, but what's the model that's behind? Well, if you go to defining model, we need some notation. And I will try to use as little as possible notation. Uh, we are go I'm going to denote the latent variable, yeah, that's the cluster variable with a symbol x, an uppercase x. Yeah, so x can take on the value 1, that means to cluster belonging to cluster number 1, and can take on the value 2, which belongs, you belong to cluster number 2. The observed variables, uh, you already saw them there, they are called one, y1, y2, y3 in the data file, but more in general I will use uh, the symbol y for observed variables, and then number them uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. In this case we have only three variables. What are the basic assumptions eh, of a latent class model? And here we are dealing with a two-class model for, eh, for three indicators. I think it's important to be aware that we are defining a model for the probability of having a particular response pattern. And so we are defining a, a model for the probability that you have, let's say, a pattern of all Ys, that you, of all ones, or a pattern uh, one, one, two, a pattern one, two, one, etc. And so we have eight different patterns, and we are specifying a probability for those patterns. And we call that the joint probability of a particular response pattern. And so that's not, notation is, uh, as you can see here. There's two key model assumptions. The first Assumption is that the joint probability, this probability, is a mixture of two class-specific joint probabilities, two class-specific distributions. And that some people that have this pattern, for example, the one 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 pattern, come to from blunt latent class number one, and some other people come from latent class number two. I will look into this uh, in more detail in a minute. And so remember. Uh, we are dealing with a mixture. Okay? So this, this probability is a mixture of two groups of two latent classes. The second assumption is that within latent classes, let's say within latent class 1, given, let's say, x is 1, or given x is 2, the responses are independent. And that's a, that assumption is referred to as local independence, or you can also say conditional independent given class membership. That means that if I know the response of a person, yeah. if I know, for example, that the person answered one on the first indicator, it doesn't tell me anything about what the person will answer on the second indicator, assuming that I know the class membership, of course. Yeah. That's, that's the conditional independence assumption given class membership, independence within latent classes. This Two assumptions can be written, uh, let's say, in a more formal way in, in the form of two equations. And these, these two equations actually are, let's say, define the latent class model. And so the joint probability, the probability of given uh, having a certain combination of responses on y1, y2, and y3, is a mixture of two class-specific distributions. And the class-specific distributions you can see here. Yeah. What do you see here? This is a probability that you can have a particular response pattern, for example, the 1-1 pattern, given that you belong to class number one. 
And this is the probability of the same response pattern, but given that you're in class number two. And so people in class number one have a probability of, uh, of that pattern, and people of, uh, belonging to class number two have a probability for that pattern. And the probability overall is a weighted average, a weighted sum of the two class specific probabilities. And the weights are actually the class size or the class proportions. And so you take a weighted average of this number and this number, and, and you weight by the class size. That's the idea of a mixture. And that's what you observe is a weighted sum of elements that belong to a different mixture components and they latent classes. The second assumption says that the responses are independent within latent classes. What does independence mean? Let's say statistically. The independence means that the probability of a pattern, the probability that you have a 1-1-1, one, 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 is equal equals the probability that you have a 1 on the first variable times the probability that you have a 1 on the second variable times the probability that you have a 1 on the, on the third variable. And so that's if the variables are independent, you can multiply their separate probabilities to get the overall probability. And here we say they're independent given cl the class membership. And so the probability of a pattern is a given class membership uh, equal to 1 is the probability of the first response given that you belong to class number 1 times the probability that you give the second response given that you belong to class number 1 times the probability that you have the third response given that you belong to class number one. And the similar thing uh, uh, applies to cluster number two. Well, these two equations uh, define uh, the latent class model. Uh, and the way you can see it is that you, uh, this, this term that you have here in the mixture uh, is defined here. Uh, so you can, you could, if, if you would like to do so, uh, replace this term by this. And then the equation becomes really long, but that's actually what happens in practice. And later on we will see a more compact formula. So here it's written out completely in terms of uh, uh, a summation and the product. To make it more concrete, let's look at some numbers. That, let's say use some numbers to, uh, to make these equations, uh, to show how these equations work. And for this purpose, I will use the, the numbers from the profile that we obtained with this uh, small uh, data set. And what I'm doing here on this, on this uh, slide is that I, I'm computing the probability of all one responses, uh, that y1, y2, and y3, are the, they're all one. Uh, but I also take another pattern. I take the pattern that y1 is equal to 1, y2 is equal to 2, and y3 is equal to 1. Uh, so and we, we saw that there's eight different patterns, but here you see it for only for two different patterns. And the probability that you have all one responses equals the probability that you have all one responses if you belong to class number one, and the number is equal to what you see here. Uh, and it's also affected by the probability that you have this uh, pattern in class number two, and this is this number. And so people in class number one are very likely to have the 111 response, and people in class number two are very unlikely. And so the, the liberals are really likely to, let's say, uh, have the 111 response, and the conservatives are very unlikely. And the overall probability of the 111 response is a combination of the probability for the liberals and the conservatives, and the combination is a weighted sum. Uh, so you weight by the class proportion, uh, of the liberals and the class proportion of the conservatives, and the weighted average of this number and this number is 0.46. And recall uh, that indeed in the sample, uh, the proportion of people in the 1 1 response is indeed 0.46. Well, how do we then obtain the probability that the liberals uh, have the, the 1 1 1 pattern? That's the probability. Yeah, you can see here the probability that the liberal has the 1-1-1 one, 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 one pattern. That's the probability of having a 1 on the first indicator times the probability of having a 1 on the second indicator times the probability of having a 1 on the third indicator. Yeah. And the same is done for 
uh, <coughs> for the conservative group. So if you go back to the profile, uh, to make it more concrete where these numbers come from, as you can see, the probability of the 111 pattern for the liberals is the multiplication of these probabilities. Uh, the probability of the 111 pattern for the cluster number two, which is the conservatives, the product of these two numbers, these three numbers. So we take the product of these three numbers yeah. for liberals and conservatives, and then uh, we have to average the products over clusters by weighting by the cluster proportions. And that, let's see how the um, <clears throat> the probability of a pattern, in this case the one 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 pattern, is uh, is obtained. Well, if you go to the one to one pattern again, let's see, we can go now for, from from the let's say upwards. Huh? We can look at the, the probability first for class number one and class number two. You can see that uh, the one response probability is the same, and uh, the two response probability is now one minus this number that you saw here, yeah, which got it, uh, and uh, the probability that people in class number one uh, have this pattern is point uh, twenty. To seven proportion, and the people in class number two, they have about five percent probability. Let's say probability to have this pattern. Again, you take the weight, the weighted average, and so the overall probability for this pattern is 0 0.61. Well, I have prepared an Excel sheet in which I show this comp these computations in a more systematic manner. I will open the Excel sheet, which is called anti -rail XLS. <clears throat> so this Excel sheet, you see again the, the data set, and you can see that for uh, uh, so this is the, the, the frequencies and the, the observed frequencies in the, of the in the data. Let's see how often a particular pattern occurs. And this is the probability of occurrence, which is uh, the frequency associated with a certain pattern divided by the total sample size. Here you see the, the probability of the different patterns for people belonging to class number, uh, class number one. And so this is something that we have seen before. Uh, the probability of uh, the 111 pattern is uh, about two thirds uh, for a cluster, people in cluster number one. It, uh, and so you can see that people in cluster number one is very likely to give a one on one response. It's also not still quite likely to give a one to one response, uh, but the other responses are quite unlikely. The same uh, uh, can be done with cluster number two, but there you see uh, an opposite pattern, and uh, they are very likely to give the two to two response, and there's uh, two other responses which are also quite likely still, which is the two to one and the one to two response. Well, how these numbers are obtained? Uh, well, they are computed in the in the in the equations. Uh, let's say in the in the in the Excel sheet. They are obtained from uh, from this table, and this this table is a summary of the profile outputs. But I have only the the probability of the one response here included, uh, because we know that the probability of the two response is one minus the probability of the, of the one response. And using these numbers in this table, I compute these two uh, columns. And I leave it to you uh, to, uh, to go into, into the details if you would like to do that yourself. Um, <clears throat> in this column, you see the weighted average of these two, of these two columns, and this is the, the idea. So here you see the, the local independence uh, applied, and uh, by combining these two columns, we see the mixture uh, ID applied. And we can see that the probability of the patterns, as let's say obtained by the model, is exactly the same as the probability of the patterns as you observe them in the data. And the reason that it happens is that we have a latent class model with two indicators, with three dichotomous indicators, a two class model with three dichotomous indicators, and then you always have a perfect fit. So there's nothing, uh, uh, let's say, to determine in terms of this, whether the fit is good or whatever, or something like that. <coughs> 
So we, uh, so we have seen the, 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 the formula for the, uh, for the two class model, and we have seen how this works out in terms of numbers. Uh, so we have products of probabilities, and then a weighted sum of those products uh, to obtain the probability of whole pattern. Well, you can see, you can imagine it's, it's quite tedious to, to write down the formula at the moment that you have uh, not two classes, but C classes, uppercase C classes, which can be four, five, six, eh? whatever. Uh, and if you don't have like, like three indicators, but yeah, possibly larger number of indicators. So the question is then how does the uh, C class, latent class model with J indicators look like? Well, the assumptions are still the same. We have still have the mixture assumption and the local independent assumption, but the mixture is now applied to six to, to C latent classes. And that's what you see here. And so you multiply the, the, the probability of a full pattern is obtained by as a mixture of the class specific uh, probabilities for the patterns. And so this is the probability that you have a certain pattern on indicator one till uppercase J. Uh, conditional of belonging to cluster number C. Um, and the overall probability is obtained as a sum of the class specific uh, probabilities uh, accounting for the class sizes. Uh, so it's a weighted sum. And uh, so what you saw before as a plus sign is now replaced by the sum sign. And the sum goes from the lowercase c, because the lowercase means a particular latent class to the uppercase C, which means the number of classes. The local independence assumption, and remember that that's a product of probabilities, the probability of a response on the first indicator times the probability of a response on the second indicator, that's always conditional on the class, uh, uh, is applied here to the class-specific joint probabilities, uh, and multiplying different numbers with one another, uh, is indicated with this uh, with a symbol. Uh, this is the sum summation sin symbol. This is the product symbol, and the product goes from indicator number one. Let's say the lowercase is the indicator number uh, that can take on the value one, two, three, four, five, etc., up to uh, j uppercase j, which is the number of indicators. And uh, so the local independent assumption is expressed in this way. And what you will see uh, in uh, textbooks on latent class analysis or papers in which people apply in class analysis if they want to give the formula anyhow, you will see uh, typically this equation. And so the, in this equation, we combine uh, these, these two uh, uh, defining equations. You can see the probability of a pattern, the sum, the same sum that you see here, uh, with a weight equal to the class size, uh, uh, but the multiplication by the uh, joint resp uh, response condition on class, eh? sorry, this one eh, is replaced by this one, so it's replaced by this. Eh? So actually what you do is you take this, this thing and put it in here instead of this one, and then you get the combined equation. Eh? So if, 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 uh, if, if a statistician sees this equation, they see, ah, there's a mixture, and eh, there is independence because of the product. So I hope that uh, you are able to uh, to read uh, equations like this now uh, by uh, having, let's say, uh, explained this step by step. Well, the, the, the last topic I would like to address in this video is the estimation. So I, I won't go into uh, details, but I want to give you some idea on how this works. Estimation of latent class model is done with the principle of maximum likelihood, that's yes? maximum likelihood estimation. And uh, we uh, also often use uh, the term ML estimation. Uh, ML then refers to maximum likelihood. So what's the, how does this principle work? And so how does estimation met method work? Uh, you try to find the parameter values with much, which maximize the likelihood. The likelihood is the probability of observing the data you have. And so what's the likelihood here, let's say? Huh? Uh, it's a probability uh, of observing the data that I have for a particular person. Uh, but I have uh, many persons in my sample. 
And so the overall likelihood is a product across observations of the probability of having the observed response pattern. And so if we go back to our data set uh, to give you some idea on how what the likelihood is. And so if you look at this uh, data set, and, uh, what's the probability uh, that someone, uh, someone uh, with a one-on-one -on -one pattern has this pattern? And the probability uh, of that person is 0.46. So what's the probability that the two people have this pattern? That's the probability 0.46 times 0.46. So what's the probability that 600... 96 people have this pattern, well, that's this number multiplied by itself 696 times. Well, what's now the probability of the whole, whole data set? That's this number raised to the power. Huh? That's the way uh, you can uh, multiply by itself that many times. Huh? This n times this probability raised to this power times this probability raised to this power, times this probability raised to this power, etc. And so the likelihood of the data is taking the probability of the response concerned, doing that for every individual in the sample, and then multiply it with each other. But typically we don't uh, work with this product of probabilities, but we prefer working with the, the logarithm of this pro of the likelihood, the log likelihood, and the log likelihood is not a product of probabilities, but the sum of the logarithm of the probabilities of having the observed response pattern. And if you put it in a formula, the log likelihood, the L, L from log likelihood, is a sum over individuals of the logarithm, the natural logarithm of the probability associated with their response pattern. You can see here that I'm changing a bit notation. I, the y is now in bold face, uh, and that is a kind of short uh, hand uh, way to uh, uh, express what you see here y1 till yj. And so instead of writing it out completely, say it goes from 1 to, uh, to j, uh, uh, you can say this is a vector of responses. And the vector in statistics is typically denoted by, uh, by a bold case. I'm putting here the i here uh, to refer to the response of a person, a person number i. So here you take a sum over all the individuals, but as you saw in this data set, we have a data set not uh, consisting of individuals anymore, uh, but we just uh, have uh, a pattern and have a count indicating how many individuals every pattern has. So you can, instead of having a sum over individuals, you can also say, take a sum over all patterns, and take the probability of the pattern, take the logarithm of it, and multiply by the number of people with that pattern. And that's, of course, the same. Huh? Say, saying, uh, take the log of uh, this number, uh, 600... Uh, uh, 96 times and add it up is just the same as multiplying it by, by, the, by, by the n that you see here. Well, if you take the logarithm, the natural logarithm, as you can see here, uh, of, the, of the probability and multiply by uh, the, the, the frequency, do that for every pattern, add it up, then you have what we call the log likelihood value. And, so, uh, if you, and the log likelihood value is minus 2295.38. And if you look at the latent gold uh, output, you will see uh, that indeed uh, the, 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 the log likelihood value reported by the program equals 0.279538. Uh, 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 check that. To be sure, as you can see, yeah, yeah, you get the same uh, answer here in the Excel file as Latin Gold provides. <clears throat> but the, uh, the 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 number by its own it doesn't have a clear meaning. Right? Just uh, it's always a negative number. Uh, but 
for the what you do for the estimation is make this number as large as possible, yeah? as uh, less negative as possible. Yeah? And, and what you will see is uh, here you see the, the, the parameter values that we obtained, yeah? the maximum likelihood uh, values of the parameters. But suppose that uh, I put in, uh, instead of the, the parameter value uh, that I obtained, I put in a different value. Uh, so that you say, well, in class number two, uh, the probability is not a number that I found uh, use, using the maximum likelihood procedure, but it's point, point 0.8. And you will see that the likelihoods uh, became more negative. Uh, so uh, any other parameter values or any other values that you use for the, for, these pro for the probabilities will give a likelihood, a log likelihood, which is lower, more negative than the one that we obtained by maximizing the likelihood. And so as I indicated, uh, this is the, the maximum likelihood solution. Uh, we verified uh, that indeed, uh, if you put in other values, uh, that the likelihood will become lower, but it will become more negative. Well, I uh, explained the principle of, of maximum likelihood. So you find the parameter estimates uh, that make this log likelihood as large as possible, uh, that make your data as likely as, as possible. And, and on the log uh, scale, it, it's maybe not so uh, a bit more difficult to interpret, but maximizing the likelihood and maximizing the log likelihood is the same thing. And in practice, we work with the log likelihood. But how this is done in practice? Eh? So we, to find the maximum solution, we need what we call an estimation algorithm. Eh? So the estimation method is maximum likelihood, but we need an algorithm to apply the method. And uh, two algorithms which are really uh, that, uh, which I used in in class analysis are the expectation maximization algorithm, also known as the EM algorithm. And, and in one of the next videos, I will talk shortly about the EM algorithm. Another algorithm which is used is a it's called the Newton Repson algorithm, which is a kind of general al algorithm for uh, dealing with optimization problems. This ends uh, this video. Uh, thank you for your attention.